Welcome, I am Cyril Stoba. Nigeria continues to address the unemployment crisis, particularly among its younger population. Now, engaging the team in youths in productive ventures has been part of the agenda of virtually all administrations. But such efforts are not limited to government. Non-governmental agencies are pointing in the direction society should go in ensuring that young people contribute their bit to development. My guest today is Dr. Kechi Ugwago, a public health physician, fellow of the West African College of Physicians, and a former coordinator of the Global Program to Enhance Reproductive Health Commodity Security at the United Nations Population Fund, UNFPA. A former head of Department of Community Medicine, Namdi Azikiwe University, Dr. Ugwago is the president and founder of Conversations for Change which aims at inspiring and empowering talented young people. But she'll be talking about that in the course of this program. Dr. Wagu, thanks for joining us on One on One. Thank you, it's a real pleasure to be here. Right, Conversations for Change, you aim at empowering and uh, inspiring young people. But before we go into all of that, how bad is the unemployment crisis, especially in Nigeria today? Talking about young people, I won't even attempt to quote statistics. I think it is common knowledge f for everybody that the vast majority, unfortunately, of our young people remain unemployed. They have no significant means of livelihood. And it's a tragedy in a way because even those who have done what we, the parents, have said, don't urge them to do and gone to school come out with degrees, many, many of them have no jobs. Many of them are not working. They have no means of really sustaining themselves economically or their family. And not only is it serious on an individual level, it's also potentially serious for our country. It is when you have a theming population of young people who have nothing to do in terms of occupying themselves and making a living, that we create room for all the many problems we have in this society. Right, you're a public health physician and you spent many years at the United Nations uh, Population Fund. How so has this helped you appreciate the enormity of this challenge? I'm going to take you up on that and say even further back than that, as you so well described when you introduced me. I have spent the past 45 years approximately working as a doctor, um, but not just in terms of working in the hospitals or whatever, but working in bringing young people up. I started as a teacher in the medical school and mentored and trained many, many young people back then. Um, then I went into the international development arena and joined the United Nations. And a great deal of the work there was again worldwide, but particularly in Africa, and trying to empower and um, support young people. And it has left me keenly aware of the fact that we still have a long way to go, particularly in Africa. We have so many young people with potentials but who require a great deal more than we're providing, a great deal more support, so that they can indeed achieve their potentials and be the best they can. But more importantly, so that they can use their God-given abilities to help our countries move forward. 
we say our young people are tomorrow. They're not just that tomorrow, they in fact are today. Because what needs to be done in supporting them, in making, in empowering them needs to be done like yesterday, today. And so the, I have had the privilege of work nationally, but also internationally, and being exposed to so many, many young people out there in Africa and in Nigeria, and therefore being left keenly aware of the huge amount of work that we still need to do in order to move them forward, in order to make our countries and our world a better place. How does this relate generally with um, population? We do know that um, uh, the numbers of young people, the numbers are increasing and for many countries, um, the greater percentage of the population are people uh, between the ages of 18 and um, a youth is described as 18 and 40? Nigeria says 35. 35, <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. So is this, is, is there a challenge with the spread of the population? Why are people having more young, why are nations having more young people? Is it the advances in medicine, science, technology, or just because nations have um, not put a handle on explosive populations? As I will talk a bit later when we discuss the, you know, the, the program, the founded my um, organization a bit more. For us in Conversations for Change, young people, we consider everybody from zero to 40, mm -hmm. at the very least, a young person. And I say with great confidence that they actually constitute approximately 85% of the people in Nigeria. That's a huge number. Where whatever you do doesn't benefit in sufficiently 85% of your population. You haven't done. To me, it's common sense. Until we begin to define progress in this country and, be, and develop indicators that measure progress in this 85%, we are not making progress. There's just no way we can advance if the majority, huge majority of our population remains on, do not benefit from what we do. So it's one of the things that Conversations for Change set out to do. What's the goal? The goal is, is simple. Given the fact that we have this huge proportion of our population, like I said, probably more than 80%, still needing so much support, still needing to be empowered, our very future depends on that. That is what gave birth to Conversations for Change. Let me take a step back a bit and say that when I retired from the UN, when I retired from my 40, 45 years of work, mm -hmm. when you've been blessed with us enough strength and energy mm -hmm. when you retire, you do, you have the rare opportunity of pursuing your passion, of looking back on your life, of reflecting and saying, where do the greatest gaps remain? What is my unfinished agenda? My unfinished agenda are young people. And I think the reasons are crystal clear. Until we impact sufficiently, positively on this huge group, we will never achieve true progress, sustainable progress, nor indeed happiness for a majority of our people. And that is what gave birth to Conversations for Change. We need to begin to more concretely look at this vast population of young people and find ways, effective ways, to empower them, to provide them skills, to provide them jobs, to provide them knowledge, to accommodate them in the fabric of our society, 
to give them a voice, to give them a place in the system, to allow them to use their God-given potentials to actually advance our country. That to me is what real empowerment is. And that is what we set out to do in Conversations for Change. Oh, there are so many people who would say uh, there's never been a shortage of initiatives to address this huge um, uh, percentage of uh, the nation's population. But we would ask the success rate. We have seen different administrations pledge to address this. But somehow the numbers continue to rise. What do you think is responsible for this? I think the time has come to more concretely work together. It is a collective responsibility. It's not something government can do alone. It's not something the civil society can do alone. It's not something parents can do alone. Everybody, everybody's hand needs to be on deck. I've always believed in doing your own bit. All right? Everybody can do something. And where we fail is when we're waiting for other people to do what needs to be done, or perhaps saying government needs to do it and they're not doing it. And that is therefore what we've decided to demonstrate under the umbrella of Conversations for Change. We are in an international nonprofit, registered here in Nigeria, but also registered in the US. In fact, 501c exempt there. But even as a nonprofit, without money, without much in terms of resources, we felt we could you know, demonstrate that it's everybody's business. We can do our own little bit in our own little corner and make a difference. So how do you set about doing this? Yes, you have the huge population of young people. They need to be empowered. Uh, they need to be inspired. So what are the steps? What have you penciled down as, um, you know, the steps? Where do you start from? How do you take this program through? What do you have? I, I am grateful for my years of work, tough work all over the world, because then you, that's where your training school, mm -hmm. where you begin to learn, uh, and therefore can do further things, building on the experience you've had over the years. And like I say, I'm proud to say it's almost 45 years of it. So a great deal came from that vision, from the experience, from the things I had done, from the things I had learned, from partners everywhere. But it also came from discussing with some close friends who shared my vision and my passion. So even as I was preparing to retire, I was already thinking about this. But I think my greatest inspiration and guidance has come from the young people themselves. I usually start my young people by talking about my own, the fact that I have them. I, I brought up four hmm. wonderful young children that um, they're not young anymore. They're all fully grown up. <laughs> Um, for, that I'm very, very, very proud of. But I have more than that. I have nieces and nephews. And, I, and Conversations for Change has at the moment nothing since we started it but young people as my team. Okay. They continue to inspire me every day. And they validate the fact that if young people are encouraged, challenged, you build their capacity, the sky is their limit. My team proves that for me every day. So we spent the first few years after it was established, we've been functional for only about four years now, mm -hmm. thinking through how do we effectively perform. I have two advisory groups. We started with one global advisory group of young people and then another advisory group here in Nigeria apart from my team that's always discussing with me every day, mm -hmm. uh, it's important to see things through their eyes. If you're genuinely going to work for young people, it has to be through their lens. 
And we took time. We took the first one year to one and a half to conceive the program. Mm -hmm. And today I look back, I am confident that it is solid, the concept. And so our program rolls out in th on the four major initiatives. The first one is the Social Media Initiative. This was launched in 2015 and has been fully functional since then. It's built on the premise that, first of all, you need, there's, there's so many of them out there that need support, that need empowerment. And therefore, you need mechanisms that can reach many, many young people at any given point in time, thousands, millions. And therefore, the social media and other modern communication technologies is sure the way to go for many reasons, apart from the reach. Um, young people are also the masters of those mm -hmm. mechanisms. They're the ones most often on those platforms. And so we, um, we the first thing we developed was a social media strategy. We recognize the challenges of the social media, the misinformation that can happen. But what we are doing is to find ways to constructively use it despite those challenges, to put out the right information and to try to make sure that it reaches as many young people as possible at any given time. And so we're visible, we're very active on all the social media platforms. Mm -hmm. We have a very busy and engaging website. We have blogs where we publish regularly. And so it is a heart of what we do, the, the communication and media, uh, social media um, initiative. Good. So that is the first initiative. Mm -hmm. The second one is the Employment or Entrepreneurship Initiative. This one was actually born of a a cry for help from the young people itself, themselves. When we started, I said we had a youth, we have a youth advisory forum. When we talked about all the things we wanted to do, how we wanted to empower them and so on and so forth. I never forgot one particular young man who said to me, these are wonderful ideas. We're so keen to be a part of it. But you know, our greatest challenge is how do we make a living how do we feed ourselves? How do we look after our families? They were crying for economic empowerment. And indeed, that is where it has to start. No matter what rights you talk about, whether it's equal gender rights, whichever form of rights, to be able to exercise it, you need to have economic empowerment. Somebody who cannot feed himself is not in a position to claim any rights. And so he sent us back to the drawing board. We felt challenged because we were non-profits and therefore we didn't, really, we didn't have money. And yet, what can you do? We needed to do something to answer to their cry for economic empowerment. And then we came up with the idea. We don't have jobs to give out, but perhaps there are other ways we can help create jobs. And so we came up with the idea that why don't we help support young people who are genuinely interested in doing business to embark on business initiatives, to become entrepreneurs, to set up enterprises. That would involve funds, wouldn't that? It would. But let me, let, me, let me say that it would involve funds. But apart from looking for funds to support them to do it, you are right, it does involve funds. We also knew that it was critical that we improve their chances of actually succeeding. Business is a very risky business, <laughs> if you don't mind the, the use of the word business. <laughs> right. <laughs> we know that worldwide, probably only about 30, 35% of new businesses succeed. I don't have the statistic for Nigeria, but I, I dare to guess it is even lower mm. because of our infrastructure and other problems. So for us to do this, we built our program on the premise that if we can concretely 
improve their risk, their chances of success, then that we should venture into it. And to do to do this, we started a one year fellowship program. You see, it can't be just about giving them money or mm. about calling them vocational workshops. It had to be an intensive one year affair during which we train them on all aspects of business management, mm. during which we beg and f source resources to give them seed grants, which they match in setting up their business. But not just that, we also work on a change of mindset. So we call it social entrepreneurship, but it is built on the fact that in, in the C4C entrepreneurs, they come out of our program recognizing a debt to society. Everything we do for them is free. Even the form for registration is free. The various trainings we conduct are free. We, they come out of our program committed to supporting their society, their communities, their families, and their country, but through the fact that they commit to being a success. You see, our premise is if they are successful, it isn't just one entrepreneur we help succeed. They become employers. They create more jobs. And I am almost triumphant. I feel like getting up to dance. Mm -hmm. Because in the last one year, one and a half years, we have, it is a proof of concept. We have demonstrated that it can be done. If Cyril, right. I'm, I'm going to land before you okay. stop All me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> now you're offering the social entrepreneurship uh, intensive one year training. You're equipping the participants with knowledge and how to improve their chances of setting up businesses, um, given the risks involved. And you say you're doing all this for free. Yeah. Does that not limit the numbers that you can actually impact? And, well, m maybe let's take that, ju just that for now. There's no point in doing something if you're not going to do it well. Okay, so if we were to say, Started up with, on, on the social entrepreneurship uh, entrepreneurship uh, initiative. So far, what are the numbers that you've been able to bring in? Maybe in the first year, or you know, in the first phase of it. In the past seven months, we've right. established six businesses. Six. In the next two months, we will mm. establish an additional fifteen. Right. Well. Okay. So. That's uh, a second strategy, social entrepreneurship uh, investment. The third one, the third step. We'll return to this much later. <laughs> the third one is what we call the Demographic Dividend Initiative. I don't know whether you're familiar with the concept of the Demographic Dividend. It is such an important issue for Nigeria and for many other countries in Sub-Saharan Africa and elsewhere, and a few, and in some parts of Asia. In fact, the critical importance of this issue was recognized by the AU. Mm -hmm. And in 2016, 2015, 2017, all the AU summits were on this issue. The African Union has conducted a research trying to understand the, where all the countries in Sub-Saharan Africa Ah, when it comes to issue of the demographic transition. Mm -hmm. Very simply put, by, in terms of demography, in terms of population, we are going through an, a very critical transition where birth rates, fertility is declining, uh, and death rates are beginning to decline. And a given if we continue at this rate and the things, the right parameters are there, in the next 30, 40, 50 years, we shall have the largest segment of our population, young, productive, working class people. If we invest adequately in this working class now, before the 30, 40 years comes, 
we will, without, practically without doing anything, transform our economy. There can be no greater argument than that. There's also the other side of the coin, that if you do nothing about it, if they continue to grow, and when the day, the, perhaps in 2050, 2060, the bulk of our population are young people, but who are totally unproductive, don't have skills, don't have jobs, then it is a potential catastrophe. I'm sorry, I don't, I don't but this is a real situation that is facing Sub-Saharan Africa today. Now, uh, now that you speak of the subject of uh, uh, demographic dividends, as you put it, let's look at the other side. Concerns have been raised, and so where does this fall in when people say, look, the huge population is another drawback. And uh, countries, especially in Africa, tend to be very sensitive about the subject of population. And uh, many initiatives are viewed with a lot of suspicion that in the long run it is either aimed at population control or a depletion of the human resource. How do you respond to that? Two things. One is, again, I speak with a certain amount of authority because like, I have spent 17 years working for the United Nations Population Fund, and that is the agency in the UN, at least, that deals a great deal with population. So I do have some knowledge there. Why are we not making progress in Nigeria? There are many reasons, but one of them, actually, it's not because some areas are not, investments are not being made. But the investments are finding it extremely difficult to match the population that is growing. Mm -hmm. You build schools. Your population is increasing at 3.5%. Mm -hmm. Within 10 years, those schools are far from adequate because of the sheer number of young, more young people coming into, into, into the space. Our planning, our implementation do not match the population increase. And this is not a question of sentiment. It's a question of reality. And so I don't even talk about control. Okay. You don't even need forced control. It, there's ample evidence everywhere that where people are educated and have the resources and so on, they limit their family size themselves. <laughs> I mean, the evidence is everywhere. That is why the, the, the first world, if I may call them that, the developed countries, are now in, below replacement levels and, in fact, importing people. So people don't have to worry about population okay. control. All right. So, well, back to the dividends, uh, demographic, <laughs> demographic dividends. And uh, that's the uh, third aspect of the initiative you put in. So you're saying that this population need not be a disadvantage, can be transformed into an advantage. Absolutely. Right. It is a heart and center of what we do okay. as Conversations for Change. Because for us to reap the dividend, as we go through the transition, demographic mm -hmm. transition, the investments have to be made in young people. Okay. Right. I mean, so they're inseparable. Okay. Investments in education, okay. investments in health, and investments in gainful employment. Again, the very pillars of what we do as, demo as conversations for change. It is in young people that you invest, and they are the ones, therefore, that will become your dividend because there are a large number of them skilled with jobs, in good health, well-educated, appropriately educated, who will then be productive for the country. Okay. So we'll note that and return to it a little later. But then yeah. the fourth, I think we're going on to the fourth step now. Our fourth initiative is what we call the Youth Mentorship Initiative. Oh. This one is, again, a cry, in a way, from the young people themselves. 
as they talked to us, they said that one of the things they lack most, or one of the things they feel most, is that they seem to be a neglected segment of the population. Nobody listens to them. Nobody asks them their opinion. Nobody mentors them. We thought a great deal about how to address this. This is one of the initiatives that is taking longer to unfold for us as conversations for change. But it is, all, but it is an initiative that has great potential. Okay. What we're doing now is mobilizing the experienced and talented older folks in this country and in the diaspora to, uh, to come and be a forum, a network of the older persons who would devote part of their time to interacting, informing, nurturing, and mentoring young people. And we're thinking of starting with a particular core group of young people whom we feel have potential leadership abilities so that we position them to indeed get into the mainstream of this country and be ready to take on the baton, so to say, and do what this country needs to do. OK. So we've done four of the initiatives. The next step. Let me, tell, let me ask you whether you notice that these four initiatives, like I said, were carefully thought out. And we felt that if we succeeded in the four, right we would have addressed all the critical pillars of youth empowerment. For instance, the demographic dividend, what do we as an NGO bring into it? We feel what, we're, what we are doing is, it, you see, Africa has developed a, road, a continental roadmap for the implementation of the demographic dividend. Nigeria has developed its own roadmap, and it was indeed launched in 2015 by the vice president himself. We need to implement that roadmap. Every state in this country needs to look at that roadmap, which details, spells out what Nigeria needs to do to implement and invest and build the capacity of its young people in the areas that I talked about, oh. education-wise, health-wise, employment. What we want to bring in we want to monitor progress. A civil society organization is supremely positioned to do that. Until you monitor progress and actually track them with indicators, people are unlikely to understand w whether they're doing, I mean, all of us. It's a collective responsibility. I always emphasize that everything, it's the responsibility of everybody. It's not just government. Government has a role to play, a critical leadership role, but sometimes even just a small role. Jobs are pro produced by the private sector. Any mm. country that waits for government to produce jobs is not going to make it. Well, let me take you back to um, one of uh, uh, the initiatives you talked about, the demogra on uh, the demographic dividends. You spoke about education, health, and employment. Yes, they are all interwoven, but let's take a moment on education. And it's been said that a huge part of the problem has to deal with the system of education, the kind of education that is provided for young people. Uh, this is, um, it's no longer what it used to be, and this has to change. That the education system is not tailored towards producing individuals um, that would, you know, develop their initiatives and their, you know, skills in making an impact on society. And it's all geared towards getting a job, especially a job in government. And this has persisted over time. What do you say about that? Absolutely. We have problems with educations on men, education in this country on many fronts. But even starting from the home, 
if you would uh, give me the mm -hmm. allow me the, to say that we the parents often do not guide our children appropriately and I have ev evidence for this the parents not just the parents but also the society the family the, the community we sort of place emphasis and priorities on certain lines, careers, as, mm. as, that, as the be, uh, beacons of success, as the mark of success in society. Oh, you need to be a doctor, you need to be an engineer. I sit here right. today, my, my four children, two right. are doctors, two are engineers. Was that a wise choice? I, I keep telling myself I didn't suggest to them they should be. All right, it, it, but, it, it, but, it fits they, in, right? Yeah, um, but they, Father is a doctor, so. <laughs> yeah. The mother is uh, a doctor. Father is so. a doctor, mother uh, is a doctor. Gran so. My father was a doctor, grandfather is a doctor. So right. it, it fits in. You so we say so they keep become, the tradition yeah. going. And yet, my two younger ones are engineers. Not, apart from the, young, the last one who is still practicing engineering to a certain level, the, the other one is not. I have in my team in C4C brilliant, wonderful young people doing different things. One is a lawyer. She's, she's doing work in C4C that's not related to law. Um, my social media manager is a biologist doing, <laughs> you know. Um, what about my entrepreneurs? The 15 entrepreneurs we're about to launch their businesses in the next two months are all graduates, none of them is setting up business in the lines of the study they did in the university. So uh, what you're saying in essence is it, it, it doesn't have to be this way. I mean, people could go ahead and study, but the education is meant to make the individual better, um, give the individual a clearer vision of opportunities of how to help and contribute to nation building and not necessarily tied down to specific areas where we think, oh, these are the traditional uh, lucrative areas. Like Absolutely. Ever? Right. And yet, there's a message of hope in that. Hmm. I have found from my dealing with them that the young people are resilient. They are also very brilliant. It's never late, too late. And that's what we experience from this program, to turn them around to what is their calling, what is their passion, what is their talent. And so, even after that, you see, no education is ever wasted anyway. Right. I have a lot to say about the educational system and the limitations within the universities and the secondary schools. I'm not going to go into that. We know there are limitations. But I'm saying, from my experience and the work I've done for C4C, that even at that, even after they graduate, if we provide the necessary support, we, they f still find their path and do well. All right, uh, uh, Dr. Wago, speaking about mentorship, and um, uh, let's go in a different direction. Yes, you did say uh, government cannot provide all these, and so uh, there's a need for NGOs, civil society groups to come in and fill the gap, but again, it's accepted that government does provide um, the policies that in the long run affect how well the young population you know, gets along with uh, contributing its quota to development. And so some have said the absence of recognition of young people in positions that can influence policy is a big challenge. Young people don't get into leadership positions, especially in government. Young people are hardly ever in the political system. That's another issue here. And so how can they have adequate representation and help uh, to change policies, you know, to shape policies that will, in the long run, be beneficial? I mean, if you're targeting a group and uh, they're not part of what you're doing, it means uh, you just hand down. What you doing? To a large extent, I think what we're living today is still a hand down situation. But I have hope. If I didn't have hope, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. 
for me, when we say in conversations for change, we create the change we need. Mm. I don't believe in sitting and waiting for it to happen. And that's why I talk about our mentorship initiative, for instance. We will be empowering, teaching, molding groups of young people who will be able to be in these positions. It doesn't have to be today. It doesn't have to be tomorrow. Right. Who in 10, good Lord willing, and he will, in 10, 15 years, will take it. Will the older generation give the young people a chance? That is why I said they will take it. Oh, okay. They will not <laughs> wait for you to give them. Nobody ever gives. But they will have been so strategically informed and position, positioned that they will take their rightful place. These things are not done in a hurry. I, I probably may not live to see it. It doesn't no. matter. Sometimes people say, well, the young people are not ready to take up leadership positions. Uh, the youth are more interested in other matters that um, bear little you know, uh, <laughs> impact on on, on serious matters. Um, and some say, why is it so easy for youths to be diverted to non-productive activities, particularly when it comes to the, the very first place we started from, the social media initiative. And uh, how, is, how, how do you go about pointing them in the right direction. I, you do hear that said all the time, that oh, the youths are only interested in, uh, uh, especially in the social media platforms, on things that add little or no value to uh, their lives. People say that, but I, I challenge people who say that to ask them, what have you done to try and change the situation? Okay. And I don't mind is um, a potentially um, devious mind. Have we made serious efforts to confront them with or better alternatives? And the more I have worked under the umbrella of this of conversations for change, the more I am encouraged. They prove to me every day that if you provide, if you trust if you motivate, if you encourage, if you also provide opportunity. Our young people are the best. Seriously, honestly, they are. But we must give them the opportunity. We must believe in them. We must encourage them. We must teach them. Until you do that, you can't keep blaming them. On, for goodness sake, what are, if you get up in the morning, you keep going for interviews, or you never even see any interview to go to, you, day after day, no prospect of a job, no prospect of running your business, nobody is helping you, nobody is training you, and you accuse them? I mean, what do you expect? But you see, as, as, a, as, as a parent myself, I am troubled and I am worried. I am not one that sits and lets that go by. We have these young people. We brought them into this world. This country belongs to them because we will not live forever. We have to do something to allow them to mold and build this country for the better. We really don't have a choice. And if we don't realize that, then we're all older people living in a fool's paradise. All right, so young people who are watching this, for instance, will say, oh, well, I've listened to these ideas, fantastic ideas, but how do they key onto them? You talked about having a social media initiative which is robust. How do they key into that? Our website, I hope sometime in this program you can display it. They should please go there. We publish regularly. There are many useful articles there. Our entrepreneurship employment program is growing. We, if you don't mind, you say we don't have money, but we beg for money. Mm -hmm. We ask for support so that we can make the, the program has potential to reach 
thousands of young people in this country. If we have the funding, we will do it. We are willing, we're passionate about it. Our mentorship program is growing. It will have, we will have the opportunity to involve so many, many other young people to elders who will teach and mentor and direct and inspire. The demographic dividend is there. We're already in talks with development agencies and with government so that that map can be implemented, so that more concrete investments can be made. We are there. If we have more funding, and let me say that I am particularly grateful, there are all the private foundations indigenous philanthropists in this, in this country who are beginning to recognize what we do and contribute. If more and more contribute, we will be able to reach thousands of young people in this country. For the beneficiaries that have been able to set up, at least um, they're starting the launching businesses, what's the follow-up like? They are formed into a tight alumni a tight network. Like I said, it is so for us social entrepreneurship. They accept, not because we force them, but because they've seen what we've invested in them without knowing them. You know, it's not, it, we, don't, we don't recruit anybody we know. This, this is initi the initiatives you talked about, it's uh, without prejudice to, well, I suppose, um, ethnic background, uh, creed, uh, religious leanings. It's Absolutely. All right. Absolutely. And that is what is, I think, is most touching to them. One of them said to me, Mommy, I can't, I can't believe it, that sh I don't know you anywhere. Nobody in my family knows you. And yet you've selected me for this program. You've invested so much. How? Is that, I didn't know it was possible in Nigeria. That testimony is what inspires them. That people can actually just reach out. We advertise. We, it's, in, it's, in, it's in various portals online on our own website. We shall soon be recruiting the good Lord willing in another three months. We ask them to apply. And we screen and we interview and we take them on. Absolutely. They don't even pay a penny, even for the form, even for applying. And so the creed is, if we, do, we are doing this for you without, with absolutely no strings attached, it is a gift. It is in that same spirit that we expect you to gift to others. They remain a tight alumni, a network. Not only do they continue to interact and build each other up, they also actually in turn are new ones for us in their businesses and teach them, allow them to be interns in their business, learn the tricks of the trade, and so be strengthened in their own businesses. Yeah. Let's talk about sustainability. How do you plan to sustain this initiative? That's a tough question, isn't it? It can only be sustained when we have partners like you, like NTA, who share what we do. When we have other philanthropic indigens of this country who trust us enough to give us resources to do what we're doing. We are also hoping that others will look at what we're doing and replicate it. There can never be too many players in this field because the need is so huge. That is where we hope our sustainability comes from. But we're also so confident about the four initiatives. They sell themselves. The need for them is incontrovertible. Dr. Gwagu, there's one aspect of it which we have left. As we uh, begin to round off, and I'd like you to round off with that and speak in greater detail about that, because that is your background. Many are uh, the health challenges of young people. Let's look at health as we begin to round off. Well, 
what are the major health problems of young people? Apart from risky behavior Correct. that come yeah. from accidents, drug use, Correct. and so on and so forth. Right. The great next probably greatest challenge is issues of their reproductive health. Right. These are key aspects of shaping these young people. And we're very much aware of that. And therefore, under the umbrella of the Demographic Dividend Initiative, which we actually hoping to launch in a big way next year with the support of some major organizations, including some of our private sector donors, would then we would be able to focus a great deal more on that. We as Conversations for Change will not be able to provide health services or family planning services or whatever, but there are partner organizations are doing and will scale up. Particularly with risky behaviors and the question of drug use, which is rampant now. Those ones we will continue to do our best to influence through the, our social media and other publications. What we're also hoping to set up soon are chat groups. Under the Youth Mentorship Initiative, a key arm of it, apart from the elders we're pulling together to act as mentors, a key arm of it is access to the media. And Cyril, you've put yourself in a tough spot now. It is, we are hoping that on a regular basis, agencies like yours will give us the platform to have discussions involving young people around these issues. We are already partnering with agencies like AFIDEF, the documentary um, agency, so that we can produce appropriate material. You see, there are many ways to, sometimes you indoctrinate, but sometimes well, you change people. Well, e e even if we have to say it, um, the NTA has always been in the forefront of uh, addressing uh, the issues of young people and promoting the cause of um, youth empowerment and uh, self-actualization for young people. Absolutely. If if you haven't been in the if you hadn't been in the forefront, I wouldn't be sitting here. <laughs> so I am I am I agree with you entirely, and we appreciate that. But we're asking for more. Mm -hmm. um, we will be discussing that offline here, but it is important. You see, there's so much potential in that. Our Nollywood industry is booming, but too many times. Unfortunately, because they're commercial enterprises that need to make money through you know, catering to what they think are, are the mm. needs of the public. The messages that get across from those are not positive. All right. There's need for active, positive production of soaps and so on. There's need for giving the young people, as they cried out to us, a platform in which they actually come together and talk about their needs and discuss with each other and chat a better future forward. So part of our Youth Mentorship Initiative is in the hope that with active participation of the media networks, radio and television and paper and the, and the written ones, that we can have more opportunities for that kind of a positive influence. All right. And so the conversation will certainly go on. Absolutely. Well, Dr. Kechi Ugwagu, founder, CEO, Conversations for Change. It's been interesting talking to you. I'd like to thank you for coming on one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you. It's, it's been a real pleasure, absolute right. pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. And that's our program today. We thank you for being with us. Next week, we'll reach you again on one-on-one. -on -one. I am Cyril Stober. Bye for now. <laughs>